and welcome. This is a meeting of the House Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And we're also joined by two members of the House Ways and Means Committee. So welcome Representative George Till and Representative Scott Beck. There's probably nothing more important in our state at this time than the opening of our schools. And it is likely far bigger and more complex than the opening of our businesses. At this time, the primary work belongs to school districts, supervisor unions, and the administration, and we will hear from them today. And as we listen to testimony, we'll keep an ear for those areas where the legislature might play a role. I preface all this by saying that this is not a time for partisanship. The stakes are simply too high. There is palpable anxiety, and with the challenges ahead, we cannot be lost in a dust bowl of infighting, but must work collectively to meet those challenges. We are Vermonters and we have a history of doing just that. We also know that the ability to keep schools open is based on our community's willingness to follow health guidelines to keep the virus at bay. We know that if we don't, the virus sneaks in and we close schools. We must all work to keep the virus at bay. Today, we will hear from the Agency of Education, the Superintendent <coughs> Association, the Vermont NEA, the Vermont Principals Association, five superintendents and two teachers. And with that, I want to welcome Jeff Francis of the Vermont Superintendents Association, who will then introduce two of our five superintendents. And we've asked them to give us a report from the field. This will be followed by uh, a report from the uh, NEA, the, the Teachers Association, principals, and then we'll we will finish with uh, three remaining superintendents. So thank you and welcome Jeff Francis. Thank you. Is my audio working okay today? Yes, it is. All right. I'm going to only take a minute or two um, because I think that other witnesses and the superintendents who you hear from are going to add a lot of value to the committee and its knowledge. Um, first thing I'll say, you all know this is extraordinarily challenging. Uh, I've got a long career in public policy and management. I've never experienced or witnessed anything like it. I will also um, provide kudos to every individual and association with whom I've been working because I'm seeing um, demonstrations of leadership that are also unsurpassed in my observation. That stated, it's a complicated um, navigation because we have a tendency to rely on old habits and the way we work and the perspectives that we've shaped over the years in terms of the conventions in which we've existed um, do not go away. So your statement, Chair Webb, about uh, no partisanship, working together and doing our best to navigate this um, are particularly on point. Um, I, from my vantage point as the executive director of the Superintendents Association, simplistically today have this lumped into three particular categories of interest. One is the, um, the utility, the validity of the health and safety guidance, which is constantly evolving. There are teams from the health department working with local education officials to make sure that we have guidance that is useful in creating self, uh, safe and healthy learning environments for schools. They're doing a good job, but the guidance is complicated. Um, also, um, what has emerged, and this will come as no surprise to you, are key issues related to the workforce. And the simple way to state that is if school systems don't have a predictable and reliable workforce, then it's difficult for them to know how they can start school. And right now there are two particular areas that are of utmost concern. One um, is childcare. And that is we've got a demographic working in schools, many of whom have two adults in a household, both employed in the education system. Oftentimes they have children themselves and with the variability in starting startup plans for schools, we're seeing um, a set of dynamics that make it uh, difficult to understand uh, and predict who will be available to work. And then, and this, um, the other uh, demographic has been known to us since the outset of the, um, of the COVID-19 crisis, and that is those who have a compromising health condition 
um, or are in a um, age demographic where they're concerned about the um, threat of the virus. Those two things are proving particularly challenging to navigate, um, but I do think we are navigating them. And then finally, there are literally hundreds of operational and logistical issues that local school officials have to contend with. So those are three very um, integrated components. Um, two final points, and then I'll give you two suggestions about legislative action. The timing of all this is extraordinarily significant. So when the guidance comes, people respond to the guidance. And every time the guidance comes, there's a need to adjust plans. And that's a dynamic that we're going to have to contend with. But we're making an appeal to try to get the guidance as settled as possible so that school districts, some of which are very large and complex organizations, have time to adjust when the guidance changes. And then also, whenever there's a new development, um, it sends um, ripples through the system and local leaders um, and staff and schools have to contend with it. For example, and I'm going to point out here, we are working very closely with the Vermont NEA, but when the Vermont NEA or any other entity, the governor, the health department, issues something new, you have to adjust for what comes that's new. Today, just by way of example, the NEA put out a um, statement and a five-page um, plan to reopen schools, and people are now going to need to both stay the course on the plan they have and react and respond to that. So it's an extremely dynamic. You would ask Chair Webb about what the legislature can do. We're developing a list. There are two items on that list right now. One list is to respond to the governor's order to open schools on September 8th by having the General Assembly waive for one year the 175-day um, calendar, the mandatory requirement, adjust that downward to 170. And the other, um, and we'll continue to work on this so we can advise you on it, schools are very concerned about predictability of their enrollment because it affects the finances. We're hearing a lot about adjustments to enrollment this year as people make choices to homeschool or seek other forms of education. We want to ask the General Assembly to take a look at some form of protection around ADM so that schools don't have a double whammy and have to deal with both the challenges of the COVID crisis and also um, dramatic changes in their enrollment associated with decisions that are going to affect this year. With That's my testimony in summary. I think it will be consistent, but not as detailed as what you'll hear from the superintendents themselves. And with that, I would turn to the superintendents who you have invited to speak with you today. I think first up is Lynn Coda. And Lynn, you are from, you are representing a consortium, I believe. I am. Yeah. yeah, maybe you could explain that. Sure. So I am the superintendent of Franklin Northeast Supervisory Union. I am up in the far Northwest corner of the state. I. I lead 10 schools uh, that exist on eight different campuses. And I'm also the co-chair of the Champlain Valley Superintendents Association. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share some of the details of our reopening plan with you. Um, chair Webb, could you give me a little bit of a, a time, time check? Um, you've got about 15 minutes. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if that's okay with you. Good, great, please do. So I put together a little presentation because when I was approached to uh, present to you today about the complexity of our reopening plan, I thought it would be easier to show you than to necessarily <sighs> speak with you about it. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of both. Um, so this represents both the FNESU and the Champlain Valley approach to reopening. So. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the Champlain Valley. So we represent uh, 16 SUs or supervisor unions or school districts around um, Chittenden, Franklin, Grand Isle, and Addison County. Uh, I can tell you that this group of administrators have become incredibly important to me in the work that, that I'm doing. And I know that that's true. We've become incredibly important to one another. We, in the, at the start of COVID, we were meeting on a daily basis and we have just recently shifted to meeting 
twice weekly. We, um, we took kind of a painstaking approach to planning for reopening. And we, we definitely had some considerations around, you know, how, how does the reopening plan play out with the variety of groups and the size of the schools and the counties and the regions that we all represent. We worked really hard to come up with some operational definitions from the guidance so that we could apply some of that with consistency throughout the organization. Um, and then each of us then took that out and did our own SU um, or SD organizational level planning. We've also very much focused on the importance of uh, sharing our resources and our documents with one another because the magnitude of this work, um, it's, it's larger than any of us have ever contended with before. So that collaboration um, and willingness to, to work collaborative, well, to, to share our resources has been really instrumental. So I'll talk a little bit now about the FNESU approach. It's also been very centered on a collaborative team approach. Our, our FNESU leaders, again, at the start of COVID, we were meeting daily um, for the first few months. And then we've been meeting weekly and biweekly for the last several months, along with some really extended blocks of time focused on our reopening plans. Uh, we spent four days together. We have created task forces around reopening. We also have design teams focused on all of the components for reopening. We have stakeholder advisory teams that include uh, parents, teachers, um, students, uh, and other a variety of community members. We also have been working really collaboratively with our 21st Century After School Program. They've been an important part in the collaboration around reopening uh, because we know that we have, we've had needs this summer um, for after school for summer programming for kids and they've been wonderful about that um, and we also have needs for before and after school care as we reopen we have worked with um, the team that has been really incredibly instrumental to us is also our nurses they have been working really hard with us all summer we've just begun having our virtual town halls so we're rolling out the draft of our plan and we're um, People are asking some really great questions and it's helping us to make our plan even better. So I'm gonna share with you um, the, first I'm gonna start off with some operational definitions. And I know there's not time to go through all of this, but you can see that there's, there's a lot of information we've all had to digest. And what we've tried to work at on as a Champlain Valley is contending with all of that information and unpacking it in a way that makes sense to us within the context of us reopening in a three-step process. So what we've tried to that, I'd like to just let people know that this is also on our website. So if anybody's having difficulty reading this, it, you can pick it up on the website. Thank you. You're welcome. So across the top, it really is just identifying these are the, you know, like the most restrictive first step where everybody would be in a remote learning phase. The step that we're gonna be reopening at right now and then the, the least restrictive step at a step three. And what we've tried to come up with are some common definitions around what are the health and safety measures and how do we interpret those? What do we look at in terms of what would the learning look like in each of those phases? Um, and what's the provision for school meals? So this, is, this continues to be a document that we um, come back to on a really regular basis. We add to as there are changes in the guidance and things are updated, we come back to these definitions and we try to uh, clarify some things that aren't clear because we know it's really important that we get this right for the start of the year. We also have tried to unpack what the guidance says about transportation around use of our school facilities, what it looks like for uh, physical education and use of our gym, what it also looks like for music. And I can say that we know that this is not final format, music in particular, we know we need to go back and make revisions around brass and woodwinds. We're waiting for some clarification on that. So it's complex, but we're trying to do the work together of unpacking it and really understanding with consistency. From there, I have taken the operational definitions and you know, we've looked at our, our local approach to planning for reopening and we have actually dividing, divided up the work into nine sections. So this is kind of what our framework uh, is based upon. So we've had a team, multiple teams actually, we've had a design team and then a stakeholder advisory team working with that design team for each of these nine categories. So it's difficult to represent what that looks like without showing you an example. 
So what I did today was I pulled out one piece of our uh, reopening framework to share with you, and that is our health and safety framework. So you can see how we have structured. Uh, each of our teams has a team lead. We also have a school nurse team lead on each of our reopening um, plans. We have a leadership team who's been really centrally focused on unpacking all of this work and making sure that we're ready for the return of our students and staff. And then we have also had advisory team members that are representative of, of a broader base of stakeholders. So we worked, uh, those teams worked to identify what are the key considerations in the health and safety guidance that we need to consider as we're developing our local plan. And then what are the questions this team needs to be able to ask? So this represents um, all of the key considerations and questions. I apologize, it's looking like the way I cut and pasted this in, cut a little bit of it off. Um, there are also some links, resources embedded in there that the leaders will be able to uh, grab and use when they're working on this in their buildings. We then took the key considerations and the questions to consider in order to develop what the reopening plan is for that particular category. So you can see that we have, we know that we're gonna to need to be flexible and be able to shift between most restrictive to least restrictive uh, steps along the way. And we have identified those areas that we need to contend with. Just in the you know interest of time, I won't go through all of this, but you certainly can see it later. Uh, so it's, it's quite comprehensive. We have tried to work together to say, you know, how do we operationalize all of these things so that we're ready to make sure uh, that, that these, um, all of these things we've identified like um, minimizing parent, family, school visits, that's part of the health and safety guidance. So we've tried to unpack what does that look like in each step along the way? What's the health and safety education that has to happen for all of our stakeholders and what does that look like along the way? So you can see that this is, there's still some sections that we know we're going to get guidance on. So we've tried to indicate that in our reopening framework. Um, and we have taken this framework to serve as a foundation for the tasks that we'll have to do as a school and an organization to be able to reopen. So um, this is a sample. Again, this is the health and safety part of the task list. This is the uh, work plan, if you will. And I will just say the statuses are updated because a lot of these are in process at this point. So we took that reopening framework and we've unpacked it into in order to operationalize this, these are the tasks that we have to do. We've identified what's our deadline, who are the people who are responsible, what resources will they need, and then we have created a spot for them to put their product so that we can collaboratively use it across schools. And again, the work is huge, so we're trying to make it where we can develop a tool, we can share it across all 10 of our, our schools um, in order to be as efficient as possible. So you can see that in order to just unpack this one section, it's quite complex and there's a lot here uh, that needs to be done in order for us to get ready. And we have people working on that right now. Um, we're shifting into this logistical phase where people are, are doing all of these tasks and getting ready for the year to start. So there's something that Jeff mentioned when he was speaking that I just wanna you know, address and that is that as we, as we continue to receive guidance, we unpack that guidance and we have to put that into, through the operational lens of how does this change our framework? And then what's the work that needs to happen in order for us to be able to um, put this into practice? So I can't stress enough that this is complex. Um, I feel like we have the right people working on this throughout the region and uh, locally at FNESU. I feel strongly that we have the right people working on this, we're trying to engage our stakeholders as much as we can, um, but it, it is, it's very complex work. So I hope, hope I didn't overwhelm you, but I, I thought it best to just share some artifacts with you. I thought that might help you to be able to see the complexity that all of these leaders are working with during this time. I, I can't hear you. Kate, you're muted. I think I know that by now. I don't usually mute myself, sorry. Um, I, this is a, a, 
This is a model that is drawn from 16 school districts that have some pretty different, uh, different numbers, different buildings, different uh, situations. And I'm wondering, given that you were able to bring 16 different districts together, do you see that there's a possibility for other regions to replicate this process? I, I think um, I want to just clarify that the operational definitions and that how we chose to come back, that's the part where we chose to work and to try to get into alignment, the, the framework and the, the task list that's specific to, to our SU. Um, but certainly is modeled after the work. I know um, we, we actually borrowed the tool from one of the Addison supervisor unions. Um, so I think that, um, I just wanted to make sure I said that, but do I think that other people could um, do something similar? I think it's hard to know what resources other people have available to them. And um, I think that we were all given guidance that allowed us the flexibility to figure out how we were gonna reopen our schools. We recognize as Champlain Valley that our decisions all impact one another because we share students and we share um, some of our employees or parents in some of those other regions. That's the intention behind us making those decisions that we did. I uh, recognize that adds complexity to other regions. I, I mean, do I think others could collaborate as well? Sure, I think others could collaborate as well, but I think geographically, I'm not sure that that others are, are, I guess I can't speak to how others are working with their regional partners. Thank you. I think what we will do is we will um, move on to um, Randy Lowe from the Bennington Rutland Supervisory District and um, we will, we will see what we have for uh, additional questions following this. So thank you very much, Lynn Coda. You're welcome. And welcome, Randy. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you for welcoming me today. And it's a, a great uh, privilege to speak with you. I should probably say that I became superintendent on, on July 1st. <laughs> so I'm about four weeks into this. Um, and, and I don't have a team of other regional folks I've been partnering with. So, um, so I guess I'll sort of put, put that out as I, as I share with you our plan. I am the superintendent with the Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union. So we are a very large supervisory union um, in the greater Manchester area. So we're Southwestern Vermont. Um, and um, I'll share with you our reopening plan, but I'm going to frame the workout a little bit like Lynn did. It's so interesting to see how, uh, how she approached it. Um, and I think our approach is similar in many ways. I, I came to this rolling out um, a, a plan that was built on three concepts, relationships, safety, and trust. And those three concepts I said at the very beginning. Um, because I felt like coming back, it was very, very important that we prioritize those so that we created a culture and a community that was connected, that was calm, that felt safe, so that learning could happen. There was a lot that happened in the spring related to, um, there's a lot in the, in the media around catch up, around loss of learning, around urgency. And I was concerned. We have we have amazing teachers who care tremendous about about their professionalism and student learning. I was concerned that we would come back with this feeling of uh, intensity around needing to catch up, and uh, it, and that would be a mismatch for what our students needed. So, um, so that's that's been a, a kind of foundational premise for our planning. I also I took a phased approach. So, uh, so our first phase of planning included 14 stakeholders, half of whom were teachers, where we, uh, uh, you had more Lynn uh, breakdown areas than we did. We had six. And those 14 individuals representing a, a wide range of stakeholders got together and went through six main areas and developed considerations and recommendations to be given to the phase two team. So those six areas that we identified included um, scheduling and logistics, operations, instruction, uh, physical health, social emotional health, and communication. So, uh, so for three weeks in June, this team met very, very regularly. 
and, and to, created this list of recommendations to go to the phase two team. We then began our phase two team at the very end of June, beginning of July, and that went until July 21st. We then took those six areas and had people assigned to those six teams to take a deep dive into planning, making recommendations, um, details related to the six areas. And I had 41 people involved in that work. Um, so again, a wide range of stakeholders. Um, again, as Lynn said, our nurses took a, a, a key role in this work. They are working tirelessly and um, we, have, we have many, many teachers involved, leaders, food service, facilities, um, central office leaders, parents. So just a, a, a large group of folks engaged in this work. So, um, so I, I, I live in the community that had what I kind of refer to as the COVID scare. So I'm going to kind of insert in the middle of my planning that experience because I think it's important for all of you to hear what that was like for me as a new superintendent. So as I said, phase two work went through the 21st. On July 10th, um, I sent a survey out to all of our families expressing, asking them about their interest in, in engaging in a distance learning model. I really didn't have any idea. So I sent that survey out July 10th and it was closing a week later on July 17th. On July 12th, Sunday night, about 9 p.m., I received communication letting me know that a child had tested positive at a camp that was housed in one of our schools. So I thought, here we go. Right, this is, this is it. So first thing Monday morning, I was in contact with our fac facilities director, the um, director of the camp, with Jeff Francis, uh, with Secretary French, with Dr. Brina Holmes from the Department of Health. And I started saying, what, what are my actions? I need some information. I arm myself with facts. Um, and by 10 o'clock that morning, it was becoming clear to me that, that this is, was not a, a one uh, individual event, um, that it was much larger than the camp. Um, antigen testing was happening within our community and it almost felt like by the hour, the numbers of positive antigen tests were increasing. I, uh, I, stayed out of the communication as much as I possibly could. I did not engage. I was on the phone or texting or emailing Dr. Holmes every day, multiple times a day. I spoke with Secretary French and Jeff Francis every day, I believe that week. And, um, and I watched the impact on our community. Um, uh, I, I'm, um, <clears throat> I know that Representative James is in our community, so she knows what I'm talking about. It became pretty intense. It, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of um, concern. Uh, our businesses voluntarily shut down. Um, everyone went right back into staying at home, um, and people were, were very frightened. Uh, I worked with the Department of Health to set up a pop-up site um, in, at in the mountain towns where near where we are, Southwest Vermont Medical Center set up a pop-up site. We, I believe, tested a thousand plus people over the course of that week for using PCR tests. Um, and uh, you know, the results of those indicated that um, indicated that that the out outbreak was not what we had thought it was originally. And thankfully for that, our community was not impacted the way that it could have. And I'm really grateful for that, for our families and community members. That was a, a lesson for me, right? There was a lot for me to learn as a brand new superintendent and somebody who's planning for the reopening of our schools. So I had, I'll go back to this survey because the reason I mentioned it is because as I said, it was open from the 10th until the 17th. So I had this opportunity to disaggregate the responses to see in the time before uh, from the 10th until the morning of the 13th, what was the feedback from my community? Um, I received 403 responses to that survey, which is a pretty high return rate. 
Um, 80% and uh, 90% of those responses came in in that first weekend. So I have a 10% response rate that came in over the course of that week. Um, the overall responses indicated that 42% of our families would like an in-person educational model for their children. Um, when I pull out only that 10% of the week in which um, we had the scare, um, the results of that survey from our families indicated that only 18% of our families would want in-person instruction. So that, that didn't, it was a small enough per percentage that it didn't impact our overall um, numbers, but it was helpful for me to see pe people are going to be scared. Um, and the idea of sending your children to school, even if the science is sound, um, is it's, it's a concern. So um, I made a decision to sort of pause and to, to think about our opening plan, um, understanding that I can have all the confidence in the world in the, in the health guidance, and I do. I, I have gotten to know Dr. Holmes very well, and I have learned a lot about what we've got in place, and I trust it. I know that the, the protocols that we can put in place will work. But we're also dealing with people. We're dealing with people who are really scared, teachers, staff, families. And so, so the plan that we rolled out, which we just rolled out on Tuesday, um, is somewhat different than other plans are. And I um, am happy to share with you this um, in a PowerPoint. I did not submit this Representative Webb. Um, I'm happy to if you want to, but I just thought it might be helpful for you to see it um, because it is, I believe, a somewhat different approach than some other folks are doing, but I um, feel like it's the right one for our community right now. And we'd love to see it if you could send it to Avery. Okay, and I can share it now. That's okay with you. Yeah. Oh no, I can't. No. Um, I don't have permission. We can. You can host. Um, how long do you, I have? A, I have a, about five more minutes, I think. Okay. This is this is quick. Okay. Um, Avery, can you give her uh, hosting? I can. You know what? I can also just talk. If you're comfortable with me talking, I don't mind not sharing it either. So what we're doing is we're taking um, what I, a phased in approach to the start you're of the now, You're now a co-host, so. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just talk because I know we're tight on time. Um, so we are gonna be starting primarily remote in a distance learning model for most of our families. We are gonna have our schools open for 10 to 20% of our students who, um, who need to be in school in order to meaningfully access their education. They'll be proctored by a staff member um, and uh, we'll be housing them in specific classrooms in the school. Our staff will, and teachers will also be in school working. So this will give us an opportunity for a, a brief period of time. Um, I'm anticipating probably two to four weeks to really get all of our protocols up and running. We get ourselves our health and safety screenings. We get the flow of the, um, you know, the flow of traffic through the school. Our teachers get used to being in their classrooms again, seeing each other, um, reconnecting. Uh, we get our cleaning protocols on, all underway. And I want to do that in, in a way that um, has fewer students and we can all kind of adjust to being back in school. The second step, once we feel like we've got that in place, is going to be to bringing in our uh, about 50% of our students in grades K to five or six in our K to six schools. And so um, the guidance has been clear that our youngest students, we wanna get them in as quickly as possible. So we'll bring them in, we'll have kids divided into two cohorts, cohort A and cohort B. A will come to school Monday, Tuesday and learn remotely Wednesday through Friday. Cohort B will come in on Thursday and Friday and attend, uh, have distance learning uh, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Wednesday, we will be deep cleaning all of our buildings in the middle, uh, in the afternoons between cohorts. Once we have our elementary students in, then we'll bring back our middle school students in the same format. And um, we are only a K-8 system. We have choice for high school. So, um, so we'll stay in that as much as possible and we'll be tweaking and adjusting and bringing more students back when we can um, based on numbers and size. Um, we have tents ordered, uh, large 20 by 40 tents so that people can be outside learning as much as possible. Um, and um, I'm trying to think what else. 
we um, I'm hopeful that, you know, best case scenario is everyone's back in school by October 1st in the hybrid model that I'm proposing. Uh, it could take, you know, I'm anticipating probably mid-October uh, we'd be having everybody back, but it's going to depend on a lot of factors. This is new for everybody. Um, but so far the feedback has been, has been um, really pretty um, positive. Teachers have been positive, felt cared for, felt heard. Families understand they are in general uh, appreciating the kind of slow entry, careful um, approach we're taking. Um, we're trying to be very responsive to the families that are you know, really concerned. Um, and so we are gonna do everything we can to get those families, the kids who really need to be in the buildings in the buildings right at the start of the year. So I think that's probably um, kind of our, our plan in a nutshell. At this point, the last comment I'll make is that our, um, at this point, our schools are now engaged in the work of planning the logistics for their buildings based on all of the phase two, two work that was completed. And they're just starting that right now. Um, there's a, a lot, of, every school has a, a team of people working on the implementation for their buildings. Thank you. I think I'm going to hold questions right now. We're going to move on to um, the next section. I think that there will be questions that will be coming. If, if you can stay with us, that would be great. Sure, I'm happy to. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn now to Don Tinney, president of the Vermont uh, National Education Association. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. And you are also going to be helping to introduce two teachers. So welcome, Don Tinney. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, I am Don Tenney, high school English teacher from South Hero, currently serving as president of Vermont NEA, representing nearly 13,000 educators across the state, which means I represent nearly 13,000 different levels of stress and anxiety, uh, for sure. We have, we have reports of members physically getting sick over the stress and anxiety of returning. We have other members who can't wait to get back to school. So, uh, we, our educators have been very busy this summer serving on the work groups in their local school districts, as the superintendents have said, and we appreciate um, the cooperation that we're seeing in many of our districts. Uh, they're also very busy planning for their classes. They're doing that independently and with their colleagues. Um, we have two educators uh, with us today, so I'll keep my remarks brief to allow them more time to present their ideas, and I know you'll have questions for them. About two dozen Vermont NEA members have formed a task force for the safe reopening of schools and have been working with Vermont NEA staff to address a multitude of issues and questions being faced by our members. We held, uh, we held a virtual town hall meeting with Dr. Mark Levine and Dr. Brina Holmes a couple of weeks ago. And on Tuesday of this week, we held a second town hall meeting with them, as well as with two specialists in pediatric infectious diseases, Dr. Benjamin Lee and Dr. William Rasco. Uh, we know the importance of making decisions and plans based on the best medical science available. So we were very pleased to have these four physicians speaking directly uh, to our members. Part of the work of the task force was to try to figure out um, the best approach to, to, to reopening, try to be consistent across the state. And so we've introduced today the phased in approach to safely reopening Vermont schools, uh, which is based entirely on the health and safety guidelines that were issued by the Department of Health and the Agency of Education. Essentially, much of this you could see uh, as a checklist. I've sent this to Avery and I believe it is posted so you can um, look through that. Um, I'll just call your attention to the need for, for time. Uh, we appreciate the uh, extending of the uh, date for the start of instruction uh, to, to September 8th. Um, it's important, and, and Jeff Francis uh, already referred to this, the need for some flexibility in, in the calendar and reducing the number of student days to 170. Um, so that will be very important because we need to make our decisions based on what's necessary and, and based on the medical science, not on the arbitrary calendar. 
I'll just call uh, your attention to one um, element in, in, the, in phase two, uh, which calls for an opportunity for educators, ESP and school administrators to meet with students and their families in person or, or remotely. Um, we've, we have a, um, we had the second webinar in a series of five webinars with Dave Melnick, Northeastern Family Institute. We had such success in the spring um, with him providing a webinar series for our members that we've expanded um, his audience and we're working with all our New England affiliates and providing uh, similar work. One of the points that Dave made today was how important it will be for students and their families to meet their educators uh, in person without masks, okay, um, before the start of school. So we'll need to figure out a most likely way to do this outside where they can physically distance properly so that they'll have an opportunity to get to know each other before they come back into the physical school building or before they start their virtual um, learning experience. So it's, we know how important it is for the social emotional well-being for our students to establish that relationship with their teachers. And that is one of the elements of what our plan is here that we incorporate, that we find the time and the resources uh, to make that happen. Um, so I will be around for, for questions later if you'd like, and I'll turn this now over uh, to our educators. And I think, I'm not sure who's first on the list, Chair Webb, but yeah. either Chris Garros or- Let's Start with Chris. Thank you. Hi folks, thank you for this opportunity to be here. Um, I'll apologize in advance for the traffic noise. I, I have young children and I found that this little enclosed porch is actually the quietest space in my house. Uh, so my goal today is just to tell you a little bit about what things have been like on the ground, what teachers experienced back in the spring and what we're experiencing right now uh, during the summer as we plan for a return to in-person instruction. So I'm a 10-year veteran teacher. I teach special education at Main Street Middle School in Montpelier, which is a five through eight school. So back to the, thinking back to the spring, um, I think as most of you know, things were, were fairly chaotic for us. Teachers uh, had to scramble and figure out how we were going to teach in a completely different way on a very short time frame. And um, for me personally, as a special educator, I was extremely concerned about how, how I would teach my my intensive needs students who I was usually right next to in the classroom and now was going to be completely virtual. Um, virtual learning began and there were successes and challenges. Uh, I'm the father of a four and a two year old and my wife and I were both working uh, full time in the house while I taught virtually. And I can say that I taught more than one math lesson while my daughter uh, melted down over things in the next room. It, it was grueling. Uh, add to that, uh, families that I was getting in touch with were in different places. Um, you know, some, there were technology problems. Some kids uh, had trouble signing on when they were supposed to for a variety of reasons, but families in general were doing the best that they could. Uh, much to my surprise, uh, I did have some students who seemed to progress better virtually. I was able to identify some resources online. I learned how to teach with a virtual whiteboard and I could look at data from what they were doing online and then um, make sure they really understood the concepts when we, we did um, a meet through Google. And, and that, that seemed to work really well for some kids. Uh, you know, I had other groups where we barely skipped a beat as well. Uh, as I said, other students I had trouble getting touch with, in touch with and that was a concern. My colleagues as well, I was really quite amazed at some of what some of they were able to pull off with such short notice. And in short, I think we learned a lot last spring. And we know that should we end up in a situation where we need to go virtual this year, we know how to do that even better. And it needs to be even better if we go back there. Um, so last school year is over, but I can honestly say for me myself that I, I really have not stopped working. I've been working closely all summer uh, with my local administrative team in Montpelier Roxbury. And we're taking a collaborative approach to planning. Our administrators, I think you'll hear from Libby Bonesteel later, who's our superintendent, have set up a weekly meeting with uh, teacher leaders, 
care professionals, the clerical workers and custodial staff. And we're, we're trying to work through the host of issues that have already been brought to your attention by other speakers. Uh, and that collaborative approach, I think, is really going a long way. It's clear our admin wants to do things uh, with, with safety first in mind. And uh, aside from those district meetings, we're meeting at the uh, building level. We've done things like walk around the building and look at what spaces are appropriate and which ones may need to be moved. Um, and I would say that while that relationship building is going well, we're, we're feeling okay about our plans, there's still a number of problems and unanswered questions. Everyone, all the teachers I talk to would rather be teaching in person, but with the virus out of control nationally, the majority of teachers I speak with are scared. They're scared that it's not safe for them or their students, and it's incredibly uncomfortable to feel that you're, you're potentially putting your life on the line to do something, but there's so many unanswered questions with just a few weeks until school-wide in-service starts. Some of those are, what will we do if a student gets sick in the classroom? Uh, we don't know. We're supposed to call the Department of Health and get advice from them. What will we do if too many teachers are high risk for, uh, or have childcare problems that can't work? and can't work, we don't know. Do we have the staff to pull this off safely? We're still not sure, we're working on figuring that out. What if the virus makes its way up the I-95 corridor and renders these plans moot? Don't know, we know we have to have a, both a robust plan for virtual instruction and put a lot of time into, into in-person learning. So not knowing the answer to these questions is, is really uncomfortable right now. And, and I honestly, I'm, I'm having trouble sleeping a lot of nights as somebody heavily involved in this planning. I wanna make crystal clear that none of these unanswered questions are really the fault of local administrators. Uh, I believe in local control, but I can't help but think that some of this uncertainty could have been avoided with some more centralized guidance created with all the stakeholders at the table statewide and if that had occurred, perhaps at this hour, we wouldn't be worrying about things like childcare. As a special educator, I know the AOE put out some guidance the other day around evaluations and compensatory services, but frankly, I still don't know what I can do in terms of uh, in-person instruction when a lot of, when we're trying to maintain a pod model that limits contact between staff and students. I don't know how my one-to-one -one paraprofessionals are going to do their work and we need guidance on that now, because as has been stated, when guidance comes out at the 11th hour, it causes us to have to reshuffle. So right now, uh, we're short on time and short on answers. And what I really want you to know is that's creating a whole lot of anxiety on the part of teachers and our community. There's many other things I could talk about. Uh, I'll leave some time for questions and our other speaker. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And I thank you for bringing um, children with special needs into the room because that is going to be, we know is a complex issue and I'm already hearing from, from constituents. Um, I'm going to go right on to Andrea Griffin, a teacher in Williston to get an update on, on from the ground from your perspective, Andrea. Yeah, thank you everyone. So I am, I'm Andrea Griffin and during the regular school year, I teach on a I teach language arts on a seventh and eighth grade team at Williston Central School, and I'm here talking to you a little bit about summer school uh, because I was one of or I am one of the coordinators for CVSD working um, in person with students. I was in person with them today earlier today on a four week summer school model and. Summer school has provided us with a lot of really good information that I, uh, you know, I know our administrators are taking to heart as they plan for this fall. And it's definitely been on a much smaller scale than it would be, you know, during that it will be this fall. Um, but a couple of takeaways that surprised me as a classroom teacher, one thing I thought and I know we've been hearing, especially in the news and everything is how will kids keep masks on all day. And one thing I'm really happy to report is that at least, you know, in this situation in Williston, we have Heinsberg coming to our site um, as well. This has been almost a non-issue for most students. 
we have students uh, in incoming first grade through eighth grade in summer school right now. Um, and it ha just so happens that all of the students we invited um, are on IEPs and have ESY extended school year services written into their plans. Uh, so that's been a really big success story. Uh, students come in with the masks and certainly on the first few days, they said, you know, can we take a break with these? So we'll go outside and, you know, space ourselves out, take a little mask break. Uh, and my own, I have a four-year-old and a, a six-year-old and my own six-year-old son has been attending Camp Maple Street um, at Maple Street Park in Essex Junction. And he's had to wear his mask all day that he's there. And when, you know, the first day I picked him up and brought him home, I said, how was that? And he said, oh, no, you know, no problem. I, he wanted to talk about what he did with his friends and everything else. So that's been a really big positive. Um, and I know that it won't be that easy for all students, but it, it was something that once we got in person, we were able to see. The other thing that's been really refreshing being back in the classroom and in person, it's really when teachers can do the, their best teaching. And one thing I mean by this is, when you're in person working with a student uh, and you see a student get stuck or start to get frustrated, we're able to adjust. And even if we have our lesson planned one way, we can adjust on the fly uh, to meet that student's needs in person. We can even get the class or you know the other group of students going on a task in order to privately check in with a student. And that's something that's really difficult and near impossible during remote learning. So seeing teachers do that again and work with students has just been really refreshing. Um, the best part of our day was when students arrived. And again, health screenings have just become part of the norm and students, you know, get off the bus if they're coming from Pinesburg or we, we do have a staggered drop off in Williston and they wait on the tape marks uh, for their turn. And it's, it's been refreshing to see, I guess is the biggest thing. And it's not perfect, uh, but I think for me gearing up to go back in the fall, it was really important that I got this experience um, because while we're doing all this planning, the piece that's missing is the best piece and that's the students. So being able to see a bunch of them in person has just kind of given me a fresh look and an, another push to Give it, our, give it our all so we can be ready for them. And I'll leave you with um, a comment an incoming sixth grader said on the first day after she had her temperature taken, I was walking her down the hallway to her classroom and she looked at me and she said, we are so lucky that we get to be in school right now. And it was so refreshing because that first day as a coordinator was really stressful. We had been planning since early June, how this would look and could we really pull this off? Uh, and it was stressful. I lost a lot of sleep and was really worried. Um, and once she said that, it just, it made all the pieces fall into place and it made every sleepless night worth it because here she was so excited to be back in school for a small portion, even though it looks really different. Um, just I, I can't wait you know and it was really nice to be able to see that this summer a little bit gives me more hope so I think I'll end with that unless you know thank I'll stick around for questions but thank you I appreciate that um, I am very inspired with the teachers what you're facing no matter what script is written or not written no matter what the producer has done to make sure that the theater is ready and the props are there, <laughs> um, you're going on stage. And I know that you are gonna carry the water and really appreciate, um, appreciate what teachers do. And we do need to hear from you because you are gonna be the ones giving us up to the minute what we need to be addressing. I wanna open up to the committee to see if they had any questions for the teachers at this point. I will start quickly with myself with um, Don Tinney. When was the um, this this um, 
NEA, the Union of Vermont, at, at the, a phase-in approach to safety reopening Vermont schools. When did that come? What's the date stamp on this? We've been working on it for a couple of weeks, and it was just re released this morning. Okay. Um, we we released some of the details um, earlier in the week. And have you shared this with the, with the um, Agency of Education and the other education? Uh, I know we shared it with uh, VSBA, VSA, VPA, um, and I don't know if it has been sent to the AOE or not. Okay. So. But the focus more is on your relationship with the uh, superintendents as opposed well, to- Well, that and also, of course, it serves for our, our local members to go through it and as, as they look at their local plans um, to go through, uh, make sure all the pieces are in place as well. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for the teachers? Representative Elder. Well, I, I, maybe this is a, a question for the superintendent. I'm not totally sure. I, my question is really just about whether the Department of Health has um, laid out any clear availability of testing. Um, of course, I've been glad to read the reports of the, the relatively lower risk to children and, and lower uh, likelihood of transmission uh, from children. But given uh, that there's probably even higher incidence of asymptomatic uh, patients in that age group and um, the proximity to vulnerable individuals and the teaching staff. Um, I would love to see, uh, you know, just a massive deployment of testing across the entire public school universe of Vermont. Um, I haven't heard anything to suggest that's happening. I also am just curious for those who may be asking the question, what will the availability of testing be and whether anybody's heard Heard anything um, specific from the uh, Department of Health on that score? I can I can answer that from the superintendents. Lynn and Randy don't uh, jump in there. Um, oh, this is Libby Bonesdale. I'm from Montpelier Roxbury, and the superintendent there. Uh, we've heard nothing about testing from my perspective, and I may I don't think I missed an email because I'm looking pretty closely on that. But there's there has not been no there's not been one mention of testing of students or teachers whatsoever to us. Um, so that's just that's just not even in the consideration from our point of view. However, our teachers are definitely asking for it. We talked about it just this morning in our group. Okay, thank you. Good question. And if, if I could piggyback on what Libby said, you know, just one thing we've discussed is there's a requirement that all college students are going to get tested and professors, but there seems to be the, the question has arisen, like, why aren't we thinking, considering doing the same for our schools? Thank you, good questions. Um, Representative Till. Not really a question, but I, I just want to tell you what's going on in the hospital around testing, because this is a real fly in the ointment. This is representative Dr. Till. <laughs> Real the, the problem is that the testing supplies are being siphoned off to go to areas which are having very high outbreaks to the point that we're having to start sending testing out of state again to the point that we're having to prioritize again who's getting tested. Um, and we're being told that we're we're starting to run low at, even at the hospital on testing supplies. To me, that is the biggest fly in the ointment to getting, you know, in-person instruction reopened because we really don't know how long that's going to last. It's, you know, the federal response has been horrible in terms of, and they had plenty of warning to, to gear up the testing, but it hasn't really happened. You know, Vermont has been well ahead of the curve with testing to this point, but, but right now it's really an issue of getting the supplies to do it. And let's uh, make sure we check in with the secretary on that to see if there's any plan um, to, to address this on a statewide level. Um, Representative Austin. Yes, um, first of all, I just wanna say thank you to the presenters that have presented so far. I am so impressed and so grateful, you know, to the work that you and your staff and teachers and nurses have been doing during the summer 
to come up with these plans. It's just very impressive. And as a citizen and a legislator, I'm very grateful um, to you. So the, I was gonna ask about the possibility of weekly testing in all the schools of staff and pupils, but I can see that's not gonna happen. Um, the one question I had, um, I think it was to, I'm not sure it was uh, Andrea, I think. Um, do you think it would be advisable to suggest to parents in Vermont that their children just start practicing wearing masks now? So the first day of school is not the first day that they have to also be wearing a mask or seeing people with masks? I think absolutely. The one thing um, I will add is that while wearing the mask didn't seem to be an issue for most of the students, a lot of the students had ill-fitting masks that were almost too big for them and would slip down. So our school had purchased disposable adult size and child size masks uh, so, you know, we could hand a student one of those, but oftentimes they wanted to wear theirs, but it just kind of kept slipping. So I think if we could have students and families practicing that ahead of time, we might be able to find out some of those things to find a mask that feels comfortable for you, that your child will wear uh, and fits well would be really helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'd love it if you could you could stay. Um, we're actually on time, which is something amazing for our committee. Um, and I see that we have Secretary French has joined us. Oh, excuse me, we're not behind. <laughs> we're not. Jay Nichols, uh, Vermont Principals Association. Um, checking the seat. afternoon. I'll be I'll be brief. Thank you. Um, so I'll just share what principals are talking about. I know we talked earlier, Kate, about principals coming in and teachers coming in a little closer to the start of the school year. So these are some of the themes that I'm hearing in our conversations. First of all, um, principals are worried about having the staff to safely and effectively reopen to in-person instruction. That's a, a big worry, whether or not teachers are actually going to be there and support staff. Uh, a lot of that has to do with childcare. And if I've got a two-year-old and a five-year-old at home, how can I teach if, if schools are not open for my five-year-old kid to go to kindergarten or whatever in person? So also worries about, uh, on the other side of that, is the capacity related to broadband and connectivity. That hasn't got a lot better. It's maybe a little bit better, but there are still, you know, last I talked to anybody that was in no said 50% of our kids still do not have the level of broadband connectivity they really need to be able to do the remote learning that we're talking about across the state. Having extra teacher time before kids return to prepare is really important to principals. Uh, and I think Secretary French and the governor have really addressed that with the, with the delay and pushing some of that time to the front. Along with that, principals are worried about having to make up those days. Uh, Jeff Francis spoke to the moving from 175 to 170. We endorse that too, because principals know that their budgets won't have the money to pay for employees and stuff if we have an extra five days on the end, student days. There's also the concern a lot of principals have around ADM that was also mentioned earlier. If students go to the homeschool route, we don't wanna see uh, schools get punished and not have the budgetary funds they need to support the kids that are still there. And I would suggest that we treat this similar to how we did with GO students uh, leading up to Act 46, even though I testified against GO students many times. I think now's the time to do something like that. Um, principals are worried about the funding issues for FY22. Uh, that's a real big concern. The, the cliff is a concern for them. There's a worry about implementation in the state in terms of consistency. You heard some superintendents speak to how they're doing it today. And just a little story to illustrate the point. I talked uh, recently to a, to a kindergarten teacher. She's in a system that is going to be going, students are there, a, a students are there, I think it's Monday, Tuesday, and B students are there Wednesday, Thursday, or maybe it's Thursday, Friday, one of those type models. And she's got six kids in her kindergarten class. So she's gonna have three kids there two days and three kids the other two days. And I, I suggested to her, you need to talk to your superintendent and your principal because that's that's silly. But that's the, basically what the model is gonna drive her to do. And, I, and I'm hopeful that we'll get elementary kids back in school soon enough where they can get in-person instruction, which will take care of a lot of these issues. Again, staff are worried about having to work with their own children are in school and their school being on a different schedule and no childcare for school-aged children. 
it's it's hard for little little kids, but it's just as hard for five, six, seven year olds. People are not going to leave five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old kids home alone, and so they need to either have those kids in school, or there needs to be some type of state solution to provide so resources for that. Uh, principals are really worried, believe it or not, about HR issues. You know, what do I do when my teacher gets sick? What if I can't find subs? How do I cover that? What if my district is making decisions that are different than the district next door? How can we have some consistency in that area? And not being different than the district next door to us. And another big one that's coming up is they're worried about how to feed students if they're in a hybrid model. So if half the kids are coming to school on, on a day and they get their food service running and feeding those kids, how are they gonna feed the kids that are at home? And what will that look like and what extra resources will that take? So while in a hybrid model. So those are the things that are really coming up, uh, coming up very similar to things that you've already heard. Uh, principals wanna be back in school. They want teachers and kids back in school as long as we can do it safely. And I'll take any questions at the end as well. And that's it for me, thanks. Thank you. Um, we will hear from the secretary next. I'm sure that there are gonna be plenty of questions for him. And then we will hear from the remaining three superintendents and then we'll really open, open it up to some broader questions. I know that uh, our committee has a variety of them ready to go. So Secretary French, I believe that you are here in the room with us. Well, yes. So uh, to speak. Sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you. And we've asked you to come in and, and give us a, an update on guidance and uh, communication with the field and, and sort of a where are we now? Right. So uh, good to see you all. Uh, I'll start just backing up a little bit. Um, you know, as you know, we decided to put some emphasis in our approach to reopening schools on the, I also call it the health guidance. Uh, you know, we looked at models emerging nationally on how to do this planning, and uh, in many cases, those models include health as sort of a topic, but then they get into many, many other issues. As we were sort of contemplating the complexity of how to approach a planning model in Vermont, we basically decided to simplify that to a certain extent by focusing on the health guidance, and we were able to do that uh, quite successfully, I would argue, uh, with the participation of uh, all the major stakeholders, many of which are represented here today, but also uh, significant representation from our uh, health community in Vermont. The, uh, that guidance, in my view, uh, goes beyond uh, what we were seeing as, in many cases, national models or many of the models used in states. A lot of that initial work uh, from the CDC and et cetera was, was, I call, considerations, like to schools, here are some things you should think about. Um, our guidance, uh, it's 25 pages or thereabouts, goes down to a specific level of detail um, and, and requires certain protocols to be in place to uh, reopen school safely for in-person instruction. So we were able to publish that um, somewhere around mid-June, uh, certainly before I think the sort of national political controversy started uh, around this topic, largely due to statements from the president, uh, but then certainly uh, before, uh, from my perspective, um, a lot of states started to lose control of their virus condition. So uh, in our state, we were on this trajectory of just developing guidance, heavily laden based on a science perspective, but also based on an assessment of Vermont's conditions, which now uh, have emerged as fairly unique conditions and that we're one of the few states that has uh, reached a high degree of suppression of the virus. So it's important to, to remember that sort of narrative because our guidance was was built based on the assumption that we, we have and would be able to maintain a high degree of suppression of the virus. Uh, so that came out mid-June. These other things have happened. Uh, a couple of weeks after that, somewhere around 4th of July, uh, we addressed the issue of what we're called hybrid learning. Um, it's something uh, that emerged pretty early actually as we delved into the health guidance. but. Um, we also saw emerging nationally this, this model that was folks were using as a combination of in-person and remote sort of simultaneously. And um, I had promised our stakeholder groups I would look into that from a regulatory perspective. You know, as you know, many of our regulations never anticipated pandemic. Uh, so we did sort of a legal review, if you will, uh, to answer the question to what extent is uh, something like hybrid learning permissible in Vermont regulations. And we answered that question in guidance sometime right after the 4th of July. And the answer was yes, uh, hybrid learning is permissible in our regulations. Here are some things to consider, especially around how to take attendance 
we had answered some of the attendance questions previously in the early part of the emergency because uh, they came up when we were in a total remote mode and we had to come up with some answer on how to take attendance. Um, but we had to, you know, really focus on that aspect in our hybrid guidance and then promote, uh, since our regulations don't really speak to any more specificity on the issue, promoting the idea that this would possibly be an area for school boards and, and superintendents to develop policy or procedures on how to implement uh, this topic because we don't really have any other uh, insight from our regulations on how to go forward. So those two issues, those two bodies of guidance, both our health guidance and the hybrid learning guidance are, I would say, basically the, the foundational documents for our approach to reopening schools. Uh, most recently, we issued a short document uh, on what we call decision making. And when we look at those two other documents, uh, the questions remain about, well, who's going to decide what? Uh, so in our decision making guidance, uh, we answer the question, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with our health guidance, you know it refers to steps, if you will. So there's step one, step two, step three, which refer essentially to the broad sort of mitigation uh, disposition of school districts towards the virus. Uh, we put in the decision-making guidance that the Department of Health would decide those step levels, and they would, they would apply uniformly to all schools in Vermont at the same time. So there wouldn't be some schools on step three and some schools on step two. Um, the analogy I use with that is that uh, and perhaps comparable to what Homeland Security did after 9-11, you know, where we put uh, the whole country into a disposition on orange or whatever for a terrorist alert. So short of having a virus, uh, it's our intention to place schools in the same disposition, or excuse me, short of having a vaccine, uh, all schools in the state would be in the same mitigation uh, step level. And uh, based on a, a lot of the feedback uh, from folks, many of whom are around this, this call today, uh, we decided to be very cautionary and put schools in step two, uh, which is open for in-person instruction with the most stringent uh, mitigation strategies employed. And then let's see what happens and then move to step three at some point. But the decision-making document says the, st the health department will make that decision based on analysis of our the modeling, uh, statistical modeling that we've built, uh, that we use from the Department of Financial Regulation. The decision-making uh, guidance also uh, clarified that school districts are responsible and school boards are responsible for making the decision about hybrid, in-person or remote and so forth. And this is an instructional disposition decision that needs to be left to each school district. Uh, we didn't think we could have, we could do that at this level because we, we have a hard time reconciling many of the uh, conflicting uh, opinions and perspectives that you're now seeing emerging statewide. It's very complex dynamic around trying to receive, achieve consensus. Um, so I think, you know, that's where the reopening guidance uh, has been since about maybe the third week of July. Um, now we're, we have a few other things. I think that those documents represent sort of the cornerstone or foundational documents to reopen school. And then we have things that I would say uh, are issues that then are created by a consideration of those documents. They're not necessarily foundational documents, but they're sort of the next, I'll say, tertiary level of documents. So we have uh, guidance on sports, uh, which should be out probably early next week at the latest. Um, we have a, a, a large body of guidance that will be coming out on special education in particular. Uh, now that districts are uh, defining their, I'll say, quote unquote, regular education environment, we're able to start developing guidance on how to implement special education and other related services. Uh, we have a body of guidance coming out probably next week on social emotional supports for students, including mental health strategies, EST, that kind of thing. Um, and we'll continue to consider uh, other, other areas of guidance that are necessary. Um, you know, and our guidance has basically taken two flavors. One is sort of regulatory guidance and the other is I call considerations guidance, like best practice ideas. Uh, I think the regulatory guidance is almost done. I, I see it as fairly stable that we are making revisions to the health guidance as we speak. Um, and we'll probably do that every month at the beginning of the month. Uh, but the considerations guidance will also emerge as a, a pattern of work as well, particularly as districts identify best practices and we can make more emphatic suggestions from the state level on like here's here's probably the way to do this. Um, so I think you know that's a, a fairly uh, quick, uh, but I think I've touched on all the major elements of where we are with reopening. Um, happy to answer more. You know, and then recently, of course, the governor's executive order of uh, delaying school. It's not necessarily guidance per se, but it's certainly related to how we see reopening unfolding. Um, 
and uh, be happy. One always pause there and be happy to answer any questions you might have. That would be great. I know that th that there are are several, but just uh, in relation to the the uh, September eighth, a question has come forward as to how, does that include independent schools? Does it include some independent schools, all independent schools? Yeah, I think you know to answer the question, we have to wait for the order to come out. Uh, so you know that's in production. I expect it out any time now, but we have to wait to uh, see in writing exactly what that says. And once it comes out, I'll be happy to answer any questions. We know that we have some that are our historic academies that are primarily public school students, and then we have um, boarding schools. Uh, yes. Primarily yes. not. So there, there's likely a difference in that. Um, Representative Conlon, I think you had a question. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. Um, Secretary French, uh, uh, one of the comments that you've made previously is that you are trying your best to avoid a repeat of spring where uh, a lot of guidance was coming fast and furious and school districts were having to adjust rapidly to that. And, um, you know, it's, it's been a challenge for uh, school districts in terms of uh, trying to open the schools with consistent messaging to parents in a time of changing and evolving guidance from the AOE. Um, what assurances can you give that there won't be more of these sort of abrupt changes or significantly evolving guidance in the next few weeks? I mean, just in your, in your opening statement, you talked about, hey, there's going to be a fair bit more guidance coming along. And I think that school districts are having a, a difficulty in having to consistently pivot. Um, and I guess two examples that I sort of hear in the wind um, is probably guidance over um, young, the youngest students and, and the ability to have them in school more than the, the hybrid models are, are indicating. Uh, and two, recent talk about going from six feet to three foot um, separation. And every time one of these new um, adjustments comes, uh, it, it's requiring school districts to change their messaging and change their pivoting. I just, how are you, how are you balancing that with the need to have consistent solid messages to, to families and parents. Yeah, and it's like the first topic by sort of creating two categories of guidance. One, sort of once again, these foundational documents of which the health document is the cornerstone of that. Um, and then the other guidance documents, which are sort of considerations or best practice. The In terms of the health uh, guidance, uh, what I've been uh, communicating regularly, uh, particularly with superintendents, is that I I intend to stabilize that guidance as much as possible. And in particular, I'd like to advertise a regular revisiting of that guidance or sometime always around the first of the month. So, you know, they, they, they would have that sort of cycle in their minds. But then there are basically three criteria that I would consider for revisions to the guidance. Now, remember, we have teams working on these things and, and large collaborative teams working on these things. That's why you read about things in the press. Uh, but ultimately, Dr. Levine and I, in the case of the health guidance, have the final sign-off on the guidance itself. But there's three criteria of I've, I've advertised to leaders uh, for revisions to that document. One, our changes to the health, I'll call health science, or the recommendation from our health professionals, and I would throw science changes and science on that, and then also uh, some assessment of the Vermont condition. So, you know, the issue, for instance, of the youngest students, uh, that's only emerged in the last couple of weeks as sort of a consensus from the research. I mean, it was available uh, when we were creating our initial guidance sometime in mid-June, but it's really in the last couple of weeks that uh, there's, you know, since the American Academy of Pediatricians issued their statement, that's when there seems to be, in my view, a consensus building around this topic. So that, that concept is an example of something we would consider as a function of revising our guidance. So uh, likewise, if there were changes in the Vermont health condition, if there were outbreaks and so forth that necessitated a change in the guidance, we would also contemplate that. But that, that would be one variable that would create a substantive change in the guidance. The other two criteria I would subject the guidance to are, is there anything we can do to improve its readability or clarity uh, that's not designed to be a, something that would require a district to pivot, per se. Um, and then the third category are just minor edits, spelling errors, that kind of thing. So I think, you know, we tried to say to people as clearly as possible, the health guidance would change this document. You know, if there is, or excuse me, the perspective of health professionals, something could change the document. And um, I've seen, I think we've been consistent on delivering that message, but I, I know people are reacting to it differently, you know, because it's a very stressful and confusing time. 
So for instance, I've had a superintendent call me up and say, you know, we built our plan around six feet. Don't, don't change this. And I'm, my message is we won't change it unless the health conversation changes, but you should be aware the health conversation is changing. And the superintendent walks away from that feeling satisfied, but then they're disappointed when it changes. <laughs> it changes. Um, not to say it has changed yet. And uh, similarly, we have superintendents advocating for the change to three feet because it would better suit their guidance. So, you know, it, it falls off both ways, but we're doing our best to be very clear about that. This, I would, to your observation, this is a totally different situation than the beginning of the emergency where we literally were putting guidance out to lay down the basic regulatory parameters to operate in an emergency situation. That's not what we're doing. Um, I will say it seems like we don't have enough time now, but we we have had some luxury of time, even four weeks, I would argue in Vermont compared to other states is a luxury. We've, we've earned that luxury by achieving a high degree of suppression of the virus in our state. Um, but it's clearly we're under the pressure to, to do our best and, and uh, to reopen school. To your point about, you know, I listed off other types of guidance. I think I would throw those into that consideration sort of category or bucket, particularly special education, highly technical, you know, we're gonna to need to work closely with the field on how to implement federal regulations and requirements in this environment. So that isn't, once again, I would, if we use the criteria pivoting, I don't see that as a pivot issue. Uh, the field is really hungry now for technical guidance on special education. So it's not, it's a different disposition than the health guidance, which is, please don't change this. I'm building plans around it. The field is like saying to us, we need a lot more on special ed. It's highly technical, please help us. And we will continue to, to work down that path. So. Um, that gives you a sense of sort of the balance we're trying to strike between these things. But I'm acutely aware of the need, particularly now, um, to stabilize our guidance and to ensure districts can really focus 100% on implementation. It's, it's not necessarily helpful to change the guidance on people as they're doing that. Uh, but, you know, the, the, health, the health science and consensus view and recommendations will be a significant variable to consider. I'm trying to only do that once a month. Uh, if something were to happen in those, suddenly something new emerged, we'd have to make an immediate change, but trying as best as possible. Um, but, you know, people, you know, people are just really under a lot of pressure to do this very, very complex work. And it's not surprising to me by any means that um, any change at all, whether even it's a good one, I'll use the uh, idea of uh, delaying schools to the 8th of September there's pretty broad consensus that that's a good idea with reservation people in large large number of those reservations were about is this another change we're going to have to react to but i think there's strong consensus that it was a good idea to give everyone a little more breathing room representative till you had a question in this area um yes thank you first of all thank you madam chair and members of the committee for letting one of us from ways and means be in here but um, um you know, I mentioned earlier the, the testing issues that we're facing right now. We're in a very fluid situation. And I, I could tell you our guidance at the hospital changes daily. You know, what, what, what our policies are, what we can do, just based on the fluidity of the situation. But as far as the testing goes, I want people to remember that our um, positivity rate for testing is the lowest in the country. We're about 0.6%. We have a low um, number of viral cases. It might change um, with students coming back, et cetera. But my question has to do with the, the study that um, the secretary alluded to. And it didn't really change everything. It mostly reinforced what we already had reported. But but it did add some nuance. And the nuance that it added was that um, children from zero to 10 do not transmit the virus very often at all, whether at home or outside the home. And that corresponds to K-5 school, pre-K-5 school, uh, school ages. Um, Kids 11 to 18, which they lumped together, did transmit the virus just like adults in the home environment, but not increased outside the home environment, but it didn't include school per se. So that being said, the consensus that the secretary mentioned really is happening. And I will tell you, I was a skeptic about reopening schools 
but the consensus has emerged based on the science among the medical community, especially the pediatricians and infectious disease folks, um, that it is safe and it is wise to open the K through five school, pre-K through five for in-person learning. So my question really has to do with what the DOE, what the Superintendents Association, um, what the School Boards Association are going to do to uh, encourage or uh, even require that school districts open in-person K-5. Now, I'm not talking about two days a week. I'm really talking four to five days a week um, because that, um, that is where the science is right now. You know, again, it's fluid. Anything could change. What, what are we going to do? You know, I, I live in another world in medicine where I do QA for our department. And one of the basic principles is variability is the enemy of quality. You really need to get this uniformly done, which also helps, by the way, the, the child care issues for our teachers. Um, if we can get all the K-5 schools open. So that's my question. How, how are we going to go about that? What can we do? And you need anything from the legislature to make that happen uniformly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, um, I think I've, you know, probably achieved an advanced or maybe at least a master's degree in public health in the last couple of months, but it's not my area of expertise. Um, I will say, you know, I do spend a lot of time listening to the health experts, and I think. I think they're pretty solid on this, and I've, I've read some of the, the research and findings and sort of the meta-analysis of patterns in the data that we're seeing that seem to conclude pretty strongly that it's much safer for students K through five uh, in school. I'll put my education educator hat on to also say there's really compelling reasons why we should try to do in-person instruction for those students especially. Uh, particularly when we consider those are the foundational years in language acquisition, you know, socialization and so forth, and it's such a critical phase of their development. So we put those two things together, and I think we have a, a strong, compelling case to do that. But um, I was president of a federally qualified health center once, and uh, I uh, walked away from that experience with a couple observations. One is healthcare finance is infinitely more complex than education finance, and, and I, I'd throw Vermont finance into that. Uh, secondly, uh, I was involved in hiring our QA, QC person, and um, I would just say, you know, I've spent 20 years working in the state. Uh, we can't get standardization. To your point about variability, the system itself is not is not consistent. So we can't, uh, if we could isolate those conditions, and I, you might remember last year I published something about that. Uh, I think Representative Coopley can speak more directly to that issue. Um, but we, you know, this is about realism and, you know, looking at what, what the state of our system is. And I would also say looking at where these organizations are in their capacity to do this very, very complex work. And I would argue, you know, last year we were talking about how complex 173 was, how complex X46 is. This is in a whole different area in terms of organizational complexity. Uh, we have organizations all over the place, as you heard Mr. Nichols talk about a kindergarten class with six students trying to implement a, a top-down policy just from their district that would require three students to be in one. I mean, so you can imagine trying to do that from the state level and, and triggering off all the different variations. So I think, you know, where we've sort of struck the balance is one, very consistent and very directive on our health guidance, I would argue much more so than most states. Um, I think you will see increased emphasis on uh, the pre-K through five uh, idea. Uh, and we're, you know, certainly uh, been listening a lot to our health people. They're becoming more and more emphatic about that. And that's something I think we want to reinforce with folks. Uh, but, you know, the bottom line is people, it's not so much about suddenly looking at the science and saying, oh, you're right, we can do this. It's about addressing the emotional issues and the anxiety issues that parents and teachers have around this very, as you acknowledge, uncertain context. So I think it's very realistic and very prudent to open schools on step two. I think it's also prudent to give districts in some communities time to sort of get into this and work their way towards uh, more in-person instruction. Uh, you know, we're, 
we are fearful, I think, as a state, as much as we're admiring the situation we've earned right now through everyone's hard work, but we see what's going on around us and around the rest of the country. And as someone mentioned, we're about to bring a whole bunch of 20, irresponsible 20 year olds back into the state. Um, and we'd really like, for personally, I'd like to see how that affects our statistics and our numbers. And uh, it, it didn't, it didn't escape me that there's some rationale there for delaying K-12 a little bit to get, let's see what happens there with those numbers before we also introduce the reopening of K-12. Uh, because as we know, schools, it's not just about schools, it's about all the other social interactions that schools create when they do open. So it, it really just sort of opens up our communities to a lot more interaction. And so I think we really want to be careful and monitor those data very closely um, and just do our best to stay focused on that. But I think, you know, it's hard if you, until you've, you know, as a legislator, you've, you've started to appreciate the diversity of our education landscape. But I mean, I'm continually uh, just, you know, say surprised or, or puzzled or interested in how diverse our organizations are. And um, I think any plan that didn't acknowledge that would be setting us up for failure more so than, you know, otherwise would be. Um, Representative James. Yeah, thanks for being here, Secretary French. Um, I, have, I have two questions. So um, the first following along this, this questions of guidance um, with, with fairly broad guidance from the AOE and then a focus on local implementation, uh, it seems like districts and SUs have worked really hard um, to develop plans that work for their schools and their communities. And while it seems like they've done an excellent job, it, as we've all been hearing, it's resulted in a patchwork of models um, that seems to be creating some challenges in terms of um, workforce and childcare for teachers and families. And I'm just wondering, um, now that that has uh, sort of seems to be coming the case, do you think that the AOE could play a role at this point in offering some kind of solution? Yeah, I think uh, it's good to see you. Um, I think um, <clears throat> these these are you know some I call them logistic issues. They're the other point I'd make as a as an educator. Uh, our systems are very fragile from a logistical standpoint, and a lot of that sort of operational uh, fragileness comes from staffing issues. So that's that's why once again I think it's important to uh, give districts that sort of ability to pull their employees to do that headcount to find out who they have and how they can best deploy their uh, human resources to address the situation. Um, I think there are some patterns emerging. Uh, um, I, I know you've talked about ADM a little bit, things like that, uh, that, you know, that deals with student counts. Uh, so there's some things emerging and I would say HR issues are emerging that are probably things, I don't know, I don't necessarily have the regulatory authority as secretary to address, but there are things we could do perhaps in statute to address those issues. I think the calendar, playing with the time and professional development day is part of that. Um, but it is, as we get a better understanding of what's what's emerging, I think those are issues we're uh, being interested in taking up with you. Uh, thanks. And then um, my second question was just been, you know, hearing conversations um, here in my community and reading, um, you know, some snippets in articles I'm just wondering what you're hearing or what you're seeing um, about groups of families that may be planning to leave the public schools this year to form um, homeschool pods, you know, hiring private tutors um, to maybe keep their kids uh, home this year in, in groups. And I'm just wondering what you're hearing about this trend, um, how widespread you think it may be and what impact you think it could have on, on the culture of the public schools this year if that becomes, um, if that really becomes a widespread trend? Thanks. Well, we've seen, um, I think our most recent data in homeschooling applications indicates a 75% increase over last year. Um, the, the numbers keep increasing. Uh, the proportions, 75% has been holding fairly steady. Uh, but we're not particularly well staffed in that area. We're, we're staffed at the agency basically with one person to handle a normal year. Um, this is not a normal year in that regard. So it's literally like, uh, I'll ask someone, what are our numbers? And they'll say 1900. And then they're like, oh, last night we had 300. I finally got to, you know, it's literally that kind of uh, interest. Um, but that's, it's still hard to understand because I think firstly, um, 
part of the interest in homeschooling, we saw the spike before the hybrid guidance came out. So I think many parents were personally unaware that, you know, remote was going to be an option. And if I rewind time a little bit, there were a lot of parents uh, really begging for a remote option in mid June, you know, let's have that flexibility and so forth. Now we're seeing, you know, the opposite. I want more in person because I can't put daycare together. Um, and I think, you know, that's to a certain extent, extent to be expected. Um, you know, I think what's happening now is I would say in my, my experience, typically around August 1st, a lot of families really start to come to grips with, okay, what are we going to do come September, you know, with, with students. So they're really, this is where some of the new anxieties coming from parents are actually starting to, okay, we've been kind of thinking about this, but now we really have to figure out what we're going to do. So um, I think that's where parents are starting to assess what are the options for my community are offering, reaching out to other parents and so forth. Um, I don't have a sense to what extent that's a pattern. Uh, you know, I'm a Manchester resident as, uh, and uh, I've seen that on the Manchester area of Facebook. I've seen it in a couple other communities on Facebook, but I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook. Um, I think, you know, one of the things we'll, we are starting to see very quickly are the issues of equity play out and, um, you know, communities that have more opportunities to put down in terms of options and so forth and resources uh, versus other communities that don't have as many. So um, we're, we are acutely concerned uh, and actually uh, led to my hesitation of publication of the hybrid guidance for several weeks as I was struggling personally with this idea of what it would do from an equity standpoint. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I concluded it was a necessary tool to put on the table uh, to give districts the flexibility to navigate this very uncertain fall. My compromise on that is I told superintendents I'm going to be collecting data. Um, I have authority as secretary to collect data from them. Um, I am going to be collecting data on a monthly basis to sort of start to understand the patterns and identify the trends. Uh, so I'll be able to provide you some insight into what's going on as well. But it is, it is an area of concern. Um, but once again, it's important to know, you know, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic, uh, you know, no human experience with this, this uh, type of situation, certainly not in Vermont. And um, we've got to, we've got to be prepared to navigate an emergency situation. And no matter what we put on the table in terms of planning or structure, it's going to be imperfect. Uh, but I think we have to put out the systems, particularly on data collection that will alert us as problems emerge so we can be as nimble as possible in responding uh, in policy or, or guidance or regulation to uh, to address those issues. Thanks so much. Representative Gian Batista and then Representative Elder. Well, thank you for being here, Secretary French. Uh, appreciate that. And I want to follow up a little bit on Representative James' question. Um, you know, we've heard a lot uh, from the U.S. Department of Education about uh, future possibilities of expanding portability where uh, public education dollars could be used for private vouchers and other things. Uh, we've heard recently discussion about this idea of micro grants for families uh, to use for homeschooling. And I, I have some concerns there because this is a moment where I would think those public resources, particularly uh, as districts navigate um, not only unprecedented volatility in student counts, uh, but also resource constraints and pressures building at the local level from a tough budget year that we've just uh, gone through that some are still working on and tough years ahead, questions of ADM and so forth. I'm just wondering at this point, are there specific uh, pieces of guidance that the AOE has received from the federal government about what those proposals might look like? Um, and, and would you have recommendations to actually uh, ensure that those public resources stay within our public schools? Because I want to make sure that our educators have what they need, our schools have what they need, and that our teachers can really focus on providing that social, uh, emotional, and academic learning environment that we know our kids need. Yeah, those are great questions. I'd give you a couple of concrete examples. Um, you know, I think to its credit, uh, and to Secretary DeVos's credit, uh, she did a very good job in the uh, very early phases of this emergency, working with Congress to get the CARES Act situated and out the door. Uh, for states uh, that some, I'm talking about like third week of April or so. And uh, my colleagues around the country were very supportive of her leadership in that regard. She, was for, she seemed to be able to get the bureaucracy to move. Um, to a large extent, our support for her uh, uh, started to slip 
uh, when she introduced um, a, a questionable change in a provision, what we call equitable shares, uh, which has to do with um, how uh, school districts, public school districts are required to share their Title I funds with private schools or independent schools in their regions. And uh, the secretary introduced uh, what, what most people would argue, even if you're, in, regardless of what side of your issue on, as a departure uh, from how historically that's been interpreted. And many would say also contradictory to the intent of Congress. And um, so that, that really uh, gave everyone pause from it. I think that was the first time we saw sort of a political agenda inserted into what had been, we're all on the same team, let's respond to the emergency and do what we can to help our communities. And that gave everyone a bit of a pause. Um, I think even further, uh, she decided to, um, instead of sort of, that was issued as guidance, so we could say, well, we disagree with you, we're gonna go forward and follow the law. Uh, they then took a fairly aggressive step to issue uh, that guidance in the form of an interim final rule, which basically means that has the force of regulation immediately. And then they go into a public comment period, but we start with that as the basis of regulation. So we, you know, how that impacted us was firstly, we, we sort of what we were prepared to do the ESSER grant for districts. Uh, I'll be working with the General Assembly about concerns about the Ed Fund and so forth, but we were working sort of methodically through that from a legal perspective. And then when the original guidance came out, we were like, time out, we're gonna have to figure out what's going on here. And, but then when the interim final rule became essentially regulation, we didn't have a choice. Uh, and what we've done is basically advise districts, basically that devolves down to the district level to, to basically say, you have two options under this law that have been put in place by the Secretary of Education, the US Secretary of Education. We can provide you some advice to say, you might wanna model it out either ways to explore your options. And you might wanna consider setting aside some money in case this gets overturned by a court because a lawsuit has emerged on that topic. Um, so that's a, that's a good example of kind of how we've had to navigate those kinds of issues. Um, there's been a there's been a couple others along those lines as well. There was a, recently a competitive grant application uh, which we applied for, and uh, there were three types of proposals a state could submit. Uh, the first one was uh, micro grants to parents, as you alluded to, and the other two categories. The third one, especially, had to do with uh, targeting enhancing a state's ability to do remote learning. We have, we elected to submit a proposal under that third category, um, so we didn't we didn't see number one as being consistent. You know, Vermont school choice, the choice of a school district to operate a school or not is not consistent with that sort of national political agenda per se. Uh, but we chose to submit a proposal consistent with that third option. I will say we did not get the grant. We found out yesterday, unfortunately, uh, we scored very highly except for one grant reader who gave us a low score, but the other two were very supportive. So we were disappointed not to get it. Um, but. You know, that's, that's been part of the dynamic in the last, last couple of months is figuring out how to uh, situate our state relative to those policies. But we've been doing all, doing all right for the moment. Representative Elder, followed by Representative Austin. Thank you. Um, so just following up um, a little bit on testing, I, I totally take your point, Secretary, about the Kind of suppression that Vermont has achieved and uh, we've earned that through a lot of hard work. One way we've earned it is through contact tracing. We trace 100% of our contacts to this point. Um, I know that's becoming more difficult. So, two I'm scenarios. Not sure. that... I'm not sure about that, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested to hear if there is, if, if there is no limits in the availability of testing, that would be great news. Um, so if a, um, two, two scenarios, if a student or teacher is at school and has a symptom that might be COVID-like, right, it could be a common cold, but um, do we have any kind of protocol in place or any kind of guidance to suggest uh, how testing should, should happen for that individual? Uh, hopefully that individual will get a negative test, but if they get a positive test, um, what is the ability and the capacity for contact tracing within our schools if we can uh, determine that we have traced uh, the likely infection back to a school for someone who does indeed have a positive test? Yeah, so let me, uh, this is kind of addressed in our guidance, uh, once again, developed by the Department of Health, uh, largely in an assessment of their capacity. And I, I just uh, took issue initially because I, I spent enough time listening to them uh, to know that they have confidence in their ability to do contact tracing in the context of reopening schools. Uh, so we've, we've expanded our capacity in that regard. 
similarly with testing. Uh, though, you know, the supplies for testing are, are going to emerge as a national concern as well, but knock on wood, Vermont's got sufficient capacity to do that right now. So the health guidance, uh, to sort of simplify it a bit, walks through uh, sort of three layers of protection for school districts. Uh, the first layer is the idea of a safe uh, safety and health check every day that all students and staff must do. And that includes a questionnaire as well as a temperature check. The idea with that is to prevent symptomatic individuals from entering the school system at all. Okay. And I will say once again, this is predicated on having a high degree of suppression in the community. So, you know, this idea of a safe and healthy check, you know, you might think is not being very rigorous. If you were in Florida or Texas or someplace that had a significant outbreak out of control, but in our context, it makes a lot of sense because we have a high degree of suppression. So the, the focus firstly is on making sure that no one are limiting the risk of anyone who has the virus from even entering uh, the, I'll call it the operational perimeter of the school district. Similarly, if you are symptomatic, uh, you are required and directed to stay home and that, that pertains to students and staff. So that first level is uh, let's let's you know make keep our society safe by keeping the the rates of infection very very low. We'll do a safe and healthy check at the beginning of every day to make sure that anyone entering the operational perimeters of the school best we can is not symptomatic. So then we go to the next layer, which is to acknowledge that in spite of our best efforts, there will be people with COVID-19 inside the school perimeter, and that's why we implement things like masks, uh, sanitation protocols, and so forth that prevent the virus from spreading inside the school. And, you know, it's every time I start talking about the second point, I, that's where like parents would start to go, oh, you mean we're going to have the virus? It's, yeah, yeah. The plan is designed to anticipate that because once again, if we have the virus in our communities, even at very, very, very low rates, they're still going to be in the school because the school is just a reflection of our communities. We, you know, that's how our schools operate, all schools operate. So the sort of second layer, putting all those protocols in place that limit the spread of the virus in the building, because we can still have asymptomatic folks with the virus, um, or perhaps folks aren't following the recommendations on safe, healthy checks, what have you. And then the third level is what do we do when people do become symptomatic? It's not, it's not about testing, quote unquote, it's just people when they become symptomatic. So during the school day, if people emerge with symptoms, the guidance calls for nurses to have uh, isolation spaces to separate those those people away uh, from the other sort of normal folks in a nurse's office and and to figure out a way to get them uh, home or outside of the facility as soon as possible. So that's sort of the three levels, uh, what the school does. In terms of testing, that's, that's really outside of the school's response. Uh, symptomatic folks are referred, you know, for testing through their primary care provider, what have you. Uh, in the case where patterns started to emerge, and I'll use uh, Manchester as an example um, area where I live, uh, you know, if there is a potential pattern, uh, then, you know, the state will acknowledge that through uh, the deployment of pop-up test, pop testing and begin sort of a very saturated approach to testing a larger community to determine to what extent there is an outbreak or not. Um, but that's sort of the protocol that the health department's uh, contemplating and has enacted through our guidance. Um, there's no nothing in the guidance that talks about testing all employees or all students all the time. It's my impression on that is we're in a different place, firstly, than we were in the beginning. And we know so much more about the virus now. We have, honestly, we have a test. In the beginning phase, we didn't even have a test. Um, we also, because of our high degree of suppression, uh, this is, you know, once again, I'm not a, I'm not a medical person. Uh, we have a high degree of suppression, so it's not necessarily useful, uh, as we found with the antigen test in Manchester, it's not necessarily useful to be testing asymptomatic people at scale in a context where there's a high degree of suppression. Um, so, I, you know, I, my, that's all my interpretation. I just trust, I really do, I trust our health department to say, you know, if they thought some broader protocol of testing was necessary, they would have argued for it as part of the plan. Uh, and it probably would have influenced the great extent they'd recommending our ability to reopen or not. You have a it's, it's just to read your, that was, yeah. you're feeling that there's no, um, no indication that our 100% contact tracing will be difficult to maintain given national conditions this fall? Well, that's a big question. That was a different sentence. I think the, uh, 
right now the state, and this is what I, when I listen to uh, Dr. Kelso, our state epidemiologist, Dr. Levine, they feel very confident, confident in our t uh, contact tracing capacity right now as a state, uh, based on the conditions we see in Vermont, and I'm sure they have some understanding of what thresholds they would need to bring on additional capacity. Uh, but they feel confident right now we have sufficient capacity. I think once again, to our credit, um, yes, we were very, I mean, there's, we were very disciplined in implementing uh, you know, very aggressive social mitigation strategies to, you know, very aggressive, like shutting down our schools immediately, shutting everything down to suppress the virus. But we were also very prudent to simultaneously be making investments in testing and, and the contact tracing capacity. You know, as, as I think I heard Dr. Levine say the other day in a press conference, something like, well, Vermont is more like Europe. You know, we followed that playbook, you know, from Europe, basically, and we, we made those investments. And, um, you know, so that's that's where we are right now. We have that capacity. And I think, knock on wood, I think they feel it's sufficient at the moment. We have about five more minutes. I'm gonna, and then I'm going to take give us a five minute break. Um, but I wanted to, um, Representative Austin, oh, you had a question? Yep, I just, um, I have a, a statement and then one short question and then a longer one. Um, I, I'm just hoping that, you know, we're possibly five months out uh, to a vaccine or getting closer to a vaccine. And I'm just uh, wondering, I'm not, this isn't a question, but I'm thinking it might be nice if teachers, you know, along with other essential workers, kind of, if we need to start positioning you know, teachers in that role um, to be able to get that vaccine um, kind of ahead of time. That's one question. The other question is, um, do you, you may not know off the top of your head, but are you keeping track of the kids that log in? Um, you know, do we have any sense of kids, the number of kids that are logging in and staying online? Um, I, I assume you, you are, you know, but I, I'd be curious to hear about that. And um, so my question is the issue of working parents and childcare. And um, my concern is um, the ability for a working parent or working parents who either have to work remotely at home or on site to have a sense of where their children, uh, when they're not in school, let's say for two days, can be supervised and safe and be re, you know, receiving supportive instruction. And this is kind of from an economic recovery perspective as well. I mean, parents can't do the job of a teacher and their jobs at the same time. I think for the beginning in the spring, it, it was the only option. But I'm wondering if the AOE is at all considering uh, talking to the Agency of Human Services and seeing if there are spaces in the school or in the community that could be set up uh, with supervision, maybe instructional support, where parents could bring their children, um, even if they were working at home, they could bring their children, the children come in with their Chromebook, and they could receive, you know, receive their instruction in that space where they're supervised and parents can do their job, because I think that's a huge dilemma um, in terms of Vermont's recovery economically, and it's a huge dilemma for parents. Yeah, I think you, you're, I'll, I'll come back to that question because I think it is a big concern and one that is on the front burner essentially as districts solidify their plans. Uh, in terms of logging in, uh, I referred to the spring in particular when everyone was remote, we had to uh, create some provision for and direction of how districts would take attendance. And uh, we, we had to loosen, obviously, students were no longer coming to school to take attendance, if you're familiar with that pattern. Generally, students are recorded at the beginning of the day, uh, present or not, and then uh, many high schools might take attendance every block or period of the day uh, to ensure uh, the children uh, appear at class. <laughs> um, so when we went to fully remote, we had to provide some other options for people, and, and basically the idea is that you, you have contact with student once a day, and that could be through analytics from a learning management system that showed someone logged in uh, it could be through having a video conference call or email exchange or so forth and so on. So, you know, basically just to, to make, maintain that contact with, with students and families. So we had to, I don't say lower the bar, we had to create some new process by which to do that. 
And we didn't capture data on that because there were so many diverse settings and so forth. Um, and we don't have a uh, single uh, learning management system statewide, though potentially we do. Uh, you know, since the spring, we've expanded access to the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative. Uh, it has a learning management system called Canvas. So um, we haven't gotten into the issue of pulling data out of the system, but theoretically, if we wanted to, we could get analytics about login and so forth from that. But districts certainly have access to that information. Um, we're also, we've also implemented a statewide uh, solution called Edmodo, which does have some learning management functionality as well. Um, but we're going to have the conversation, I think, firstly, about to what extent are students online or the in-person hybrid and really just want to understand those patterns first. Um, and I think, you know, our, I know our current guidance on attendance is basically the same as it was in the spring. You have some options, school district, to do that. Uh, we haven't quite gotten into the ADM issues. I know it came up a couple times here already. Average daily membership, that's an interesting process um, that happens at the it's a census period at the beginning of the school year where we figure out on a percentage basis how many students are actually in the building on a daily basis, you know, factoring in dentist notes and everything else, you know, our dental appointments. So we don't have a comparable way to necessarily do ADM in a virtual or hybrid environment. So it's something we're going to spend a little time on a technical basis. But currently, we I don't think we're going to plan collecting attendance data because it's going to vary significantly, other than to say we're going to ask districts to conform with our general guidance on ensuring uh, some of that daily contact is in place. Oh, to your second point, yeah, this is a critical and critical issue for us as a state. We know, uh, you know, statewide, um, you know, we have issues with child care prior to the emergency. I think they've been exacerbated, certainly, as we've, uh, in the beginning part of the emergency, you might remember, we were asking school districts on a, a more or less voluntary basis to provision child care, very similar to what you were just, uh, you know, suggesting. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where we go with that. I will say, uh, I know, Representative Webb, you've been interested in a mapping. We've built a pretty nice mapping tool uh, with our, uh, what we call our Comprehensive Support Center on Pre-K. There are technical support from the U.S. Department of Ed. Uh, they've built out a very comprehensive mapping solution that we're ready to show to the public here at some point. So I think you'll find that very useful to the larger policy issues around Pre-K. Um, but yeah, we're gonna we're already feeling the need to turn some attention to this issue. And I think your, your ideas are very useful ones and constructive ones. Uh, We've had similar thoughts along those lines, and we are we have a conversation going with the uh, agency of human services on these topics. Um, but this is, you know, part of it is we we need to understand first kind of where districts are going to uh, end up going in terms of opening, and um, then we'll understand those patterns and needs. Uh, but I think this is a very important issue and one uh, definitely is part of the economic recovery piece, but also. It's, a, it's an essential part of what schools uh, do uh, for, for parents. And as you mentioned, safety, um, you know, that's one, one key aspect that uh, schools can fulfill is we have a safe place for students to go. And we, we are concerned about those, some of our more vulnerable students not having that regular safe place to go on a daily basis. I mean, just one, I was just bouncing ideas around with another superintendent yesterday. And Okay. I need you need you to wait. We're just about out of time, and I want to make sure that that Casey too. Okay. Thank that. you, Secretary. Thank if you. we have, we'll have time at the very end, and and I just want to make sure that we get. Okay. This yep. in. okay. Thank you, um, Representative Two. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, um, Secretary French, for um, coming on and talking with us today. Uh, I will just echo. I want to start just by echoing Sarita's concern about uh, finding childcare or. or you know, people to watch. I, I have a five-year-old who's going to be in kindergarten this year. Um, I'm dealing with that myself, finding what we're going to do. I can barely access um, my internet for these uh, meetings. I don't know how my five-year-old is going to be also um, with me trying to instruct him while being in committee meetings yeah. or on the house floor. So it, it is a concern. I've heard, I've heard many other ones. So I just want to echo that. That is something that we're hearing a lot. Um, my questions, uh, I got two pretty quick questions. Um, the first one is someone brought up to my attention um, regional enrichment centers that they used in New York City. I don't know if you've heard about them. Uh, yeah, I think so. I've read a quick article yeah. on it. They, it was brought up to me last night. I just wanted to know if that's something that. Um, and the next question is about PPE. Um, is there enough adequate PPE for the state? And what's the state's role 
Um, and that being said, if kids are going to be wearing masks, I did hear some concerns from a, a few parents that um, like hearing impaired, hearing impaired students uh, who rely on reading lips would be, it'd be an issue for them. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any plans for that. Thanks. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, to the, the earlier point about your uh, your personal child care needs, I would also say there's the there's the third reason why uh, pre-K through five should be considered strongly for in-person instruction. You know, there um, it's the, the the online remote learning for those students of those ages not nearly as well delivered as it is for the older students. You know, so and then you factor in issues of care and safety and so forth. So I think. We have the health evidence that that makes a compelling case for that. Educationally, we can say it's the most critical developmental time for a student. And then thirdly, just the sort of safety issue and and honestly, the inability to <clears throat> to offer a robust remote learning option for those students. Really, I think really districts have to look hard at doing what they can to, for in-person instruction pre-K through five. Um, in terms of all regional uh, resource centers, we don't have such a structure in Vermont. Many states do. Um, many states, this is this is called educational service agencies or ESAs. There's a federal stream to do that. Uh, Vermont's had a history on that over the years. At one point, we had about five of these ESAs, um, and we've sort of rolled them up now. Uh, I think there's still uh, one. I, I'm not even sure the Champlain uh, Valley Teacher Development Center receives that money anymore, and I should know as secretary, but I was on their board when I was at St. Michael's College, and I think my impression was the, the that system has devolved to a certain extent as a state so um, we don't have regional service centers um, and I use the BOCES example in New York those centers do many things uh, they're they're like technical support centers for special education they do a lot of the tech ed um, and they also have uh, gifted talented programs and so forth but, you know New York operates the system on a different scale than Vermont um, in terms of PPE Yes, it's something in PPE, you know, we use that term fairly generally at the beginning of the emergency as it pertained to healthcare workers. Um, and we have a state emergency response entity called the SEOC, the State Emergency Operations Center, that uh, one of the functions it has is to coordinate uh, the ac acquisition of PPE, particularly at the early phase of the emergency where every state was more or less on their own to go find supplies. And um, PPE for schools, I think my, from my perspective falls in sort of two categories now we have this issue of facial coverings uh, for teachers and students and that's sort of the, the broad category um, and then we have specific ppe that nurses are going to be required to utilize so the, the idea of nurses being more akin to healthcare workers uh, particularly as they're doing the sort of triage and isolation of students that are symptomatic so in terms of facial coverings the state has worked to secure uh, some, uh, and we have, I think we ran a survey, and uh, I want to say we have about 10 masks per teacher. Uh, they're what we call KN, KN95 masks, uh, which are sort of a version of the N95 masks that are really the, the high quality one that medical people use. The KN95s are not pressure tested. They're sort of a, a different variant. I would say um, as much as we're going to supply them out, we are in the process of delivering them. I would expect most people would prefer to have their own cloth face masks because these are pretty, I would say, heavy duty and they're, they're not overly comfortable to wear when you're working. But, you know, we have them, so we're going to distribute them out to people. Um, we also uh, have a, had a donation of uh, hand sanitizer, so we're distributing that. Um, Absent that, we don't have a lot of state coordination of PPE um, going on at the moment. Uh, there aren't, you know, there just aren't the, the need necessarily at the local level. I think what's going to happen, our districts are going to secure their own facial coverings because they find them to be, now they're more readily available and relatively inexpensive. Uh, to your question about like teachers of the deaf or I would say speech language pathologists, yeah, our guidance anticipates those issues and those those folks aren't necessarily required to wear a mask during those key instructional um, locations. So it, it imparts a certain amount of flexibility for instruction and that's that was something that doctors were very keenly aware of. Um, we want people to mask up as much as possible, but there's a time and a place where in some educational uh, situations where a mask can be removed uh, in the name of the educational practice. So. Thank you, and there are shields. 
clear shields as well. Yes, yeah, we have those and also in, I know a lot of districts, particularly speech people where you really need to see, you know, those, those things are being implemented. So I, I wanna thank you. I, I think I, I'm gonna close with a, a couple of questions and if you can stay in the room because we do have superintendents that will speak to us. And that has to do with data keeping I'm curious about what you're planning to be asking schools to gather to inform the process going forward. I assume that we are going to have teachers with fairly granular uh, information on how things are going. Um, they will know exactly where the breakdowns are in technology. Is it internet? Is it devices? Is it parent usage? Um, family challenges that they're having, students who are falling behind. Uh, I will be very interested in knowing the kind of data that you will be collecting and would actually be interested in being able to participate in that conversation on data collected because we also will have an interest in that, particularly as we return in January, we will then have had uh, three months uh, and, and data that we collect in those three months could be quite helpful in informing us in moving forward. So I would like to be uh, kept apprised. Well, you, I can respond to that now. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, we're in the process of having that conversation. Uh, I think as this committee is acutely aware, um, our interest in the data must be balanced by our ability to actually gather it and collect it. So um, we, on the other side of that, we had our first meeting on this today. We want to make sure it's easy for districts to submit that information. And it also has to be easy for us to arrange at the state level. So. That's sort of the other side of that. Um, but we do acknowledge right up front that uh, legislators and uh, the executive branch might have a policy interest in this information as well. So we'd be certainly uh, welcome your involvement in sort of defining that. Uh, my interest right now is a little more immediate in that I'm trying to really use the collection to one, identify uh, patterns of uh, behavior and patterns of operation, uh, particularly with some attention to equity and uh, opportunity. Um, but also then secondly, to use the data collection to uh, sort of incentivize people to go in the right direction in terms of attending to those issues. So uh, we're, we're working under a compressed timeline in the next couple of weeks to develop them that. I think we're gonna end up doing a survey tool as the most efficient way to resolve some of our collection and sort of those sort of logistic aspects of uh, implementing such a collection. But uh, that that's sort of been my compromise to uh, when we developed the hybrid guidance, we acknowledged that it would be difficult for us to um, have districts sort of also do this huge lift in terms of implementation while simultaneously trying to satisfy an agency compliance requirement. So I, I, I decided early on not to require them to submit their opening plans for approval per se, but my compromise to that was I'm going to collect data on this and might change my mind later on, depending on what the patterns of operation as they emerge. Okay, I think that we will take a five minute break. And when we come back, we um, have um, three superintendents that I know that we wanna hear from. So let's see, I've got 408, so can we back be back at 413? <laughs> okay, so if we could go offline and um, we'll be back at 413.